From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is Crosswalk. We're in a series entitled The I Am Series, Exploring the Mysteries of God. We're looking at some of the concepts about God that can be hard to understand or are mysterious to us. We've spent the last two weeks exploring the mystery of the doctrine of the Trinity. As Pastor Clay is going to explain in today's message, the concept of the doctrine of the Trinity may on the surface sound like a contradiction, but in fact, it is not. Now, here's Pastor Clay. Hey, did y'all happen to notice my, my shirt? My shirt, I didn't know if y'all noticed that shirt or not. Somebody asked me, is that, is that because you're getting senile and if you forget who you are, you can look down and, and remember who you are? It doesn't hurt to have that. But actually, the Spearings, uh, who used to be part of Cross Culture, moved to Tennessee. They were here last week, came back to visit with us, and they brought me this shirt, and I just thought it was so awesome. It says, Pastor, and, uh, and it says, because, uh, Pastor, because hardcore devil stomping ninja isn't an official job title. So I thought, well, I got to wear that at least one Sunday. I got to wear it to church. So I might wear it every Sunday. So I can, I know. Yeah. I tell you, I get no respect. Uh, oh, I, and, I, and I got a new watch. Y'all see, I got a new watch. It's awesome. Can I just say that? I, I mean, I'm not bragging, uh, but... But I just, I'm just, I, and I won't, I won't say who got it for me or anything. I, I didn't know, you know, I got ready to pack my stuff last week and get ready to leave. And there's this big box sitting down there. And I'm not really paying much attention. And then I realized that's a, that's a watch box. And so I thought, looked around and there was nobody else left. And so I figured, hey, possession is nine-tenths of the law. If it belongs to somebody else, it's still here. I, I'm taking it. Um, and so I did, but I did, I did find, like I said, I won't say who gave it to me, very, but a very kind person uh, gave this to me, and that was uh, very nice of that very kind person to give that to me, so I'm grateful, so. No. Uh, Father's Day means different things to different uh, people. Mother's Day, you know, it's, it's these, these celebrations that we have, which I think are good as families and have the opportunity we can to appreciate those, and you know, and, and we say this all the time. Hopefully, it's something we do all the time, uh, and not just one day a year. But I, I think it's a good thing to set a day aside and, and say, "Listen, we just let's say we appreciate you. We we know what you do for whether it's moms or in this case fathers. What you do is is not easy. Uh, we know that, and you have a lot of responsibility on you. And you do. You have a lot of as a father, you have a lot of responsibility uh, on you. God's holding you accountable for a lot of, uh, uh, things as the, as the leader in your home, as the head of your home. And so, um, it, it matters. And I was thinking about this last night when I was praying and, and going over my message and I got, I got thinking about Father's Day and I got thinking about my dad. Uh, I, on Father's Day 16 years ago, uh, today, Father's Day, 16 years ago, uh, Sunday morning, I received a call that my father had died. And uh, he had been sick for quite a while with pancreatic cancer. Um, but uh, Sunday morning, Father's Day, as, uh, as we were getting up and getting ready to go, uh, get ready for, for church and to preach and that sort of thing, my brother called me and uh, told him, me that uh, my dad had uh, died. That was a tough uh, Father's Day uh, message, sermon, uh, to bring that day. But... But God is good. Can I tell you something? God is good in every situation. God is good, and he, he, he just, his grace is amazing. Uh, my dad was, uh, was an interesting guy. Uh, he, he was not easy to get to know, uh, at least uh, not for me. My dad was, was a very quiet man. Uh, he was very successful uh, but he was very much uh, to himself, and uh, so it, was, it was, could be difficult for people to get to know him, even uh, one of his sons. Now, my oldest brother, uh, Holly, is very intelligent, uh, loves books and reading, and so he and my dad had that in common. My middle brother, Ashley, uh, loves carpentry, woodworking, and loves fishing. My dad's two uh, favorite hobbies in all the world. So they had that in common. Uh, I have neither the intelligence of my dad or brother, uh, nor the love for books and reading, at least at that time, that they had. And 
I am the farthest thing that could exist on this planet from a carpenter, a person who can work with power tools, and I hate fishing pretty much. So, so for me, it was much more uh, difficult to get to know my dad. And this may sound weird, but in some sense, I learned more about my father after he died than I knew about him when he was alive. I found out stuff that, that I, just, I just never, he just, he just didn't talk. He just didn't talk about it. He was a very private man. And I've talked to other uh, men, maybe some of you in this room, I've talked to other men who had a similar experience with their father, very stoic, very quiet, didn't share a lot about their life experiences. Maybe that was a World War II generational thing uh, to some degree. I, I, I don't uh, know. But perhaps that's why it, it's even more amazing to think about the fact that our Heavenly Father, God Almighty, the Great I Am, the Creator of the universe, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, has invited us to know Him, wants us to know Him, encourages us to know Him. It's an astounding thing that, that the God who would do all of this would, would say, come to me. And he says it, Sarah, come to me. And he invites us into this relationship with him where we can know him in a, in a personal and intimate way. And I'm not just talking about knowing about him. I'm not just talking about uh, knowing things that we need to know from God, okay? I, I, I'm not talking about, you know, okay, what, what can I do? What can I not do? Uh, what, what, will, what will make God mad? Can I have sex before I get married? Does it matter what I do with my money? Do I really have to submit to my husband? Not me, but a wife. Those kind of questions that we have. You know, I, I'll just be honest with you. And I think I said something about this a couple weeks ago, uh, probably. But uh, it, it is amazing how we tend to make this thing between us and God, we tend to make it so much about us. So much about what are the benefits for me? What do I get out of this? What, what should I do? What should I not do? Certainly there are things that we should know. Certainly there are things that we ought to understand about his word and, and prohibitions that he says, things that we should be involved in, things that we shouldn't be involved in. Certainly we need to understand those kinds of things. But that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is, is knowing him. Not just knowing what he says about you or what you should do or should, but actually personally, intimately knowing the living God. I also mentioned uh, last week, I believe it was, the key, the secret to knowing God. At least beginning to, to explore that idea. In Jeremiah 29, 13, uh, 10, it says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? With all of your heart. And I said it then and I'll say it. Again, only each one of us, only each person can determine to what degree that means for me. To what degree am I loving God with all of my heart? To what degree is God the, the priority? And that's really the idea there is what it's talking about. Not, not that, as I said last week, not that we go lock ourselves away in a monastery or something. But that to what degree is, is God the, the, the priority, the absolute center of my life where everything else kind of falls under that. Only each and every one of us can answer that question. Only you know where you are in that whole thing. But it is a question worthy of pondering and thinking about in your life today. Where am I in this thing of knowing God? Not knowing about Him. Not knowing necessarily what He expects of me. Not that that's not important. But knowing God. That's why 
things like a study of the doctrine of the Trinity, which we've been on now for a third week, that's why things like this are not a gigantic waste of your time. They're really not. Because understanding uh, truths about God revealed in His Word about Himself helps us to know Him to a greater degree. And knowing him to a greater degree is what this thing is all about. I'll, I'll, I'll say this to you, and, and you may or may not understand this. We, we, we tend as a world, as a, as a people, as a culture, to be so uh, self-focused that, that, we, that, as I said, we, we tend to make it about us. But actually, the reality is that knowing God, and I mean knowing God, that is actually the key to knowing yourself. So, we have delved into this in the, in the I Am series, this, this doctrinal idea of the Trinity, the triune Godhead. What does that mean? And what possible difference could it make for my life? Why does it even matter to me? Hopefully, over the last two weeks, you, I've helped with some of that, and we've looked at a lot of passages of Scripture. We're not going to be looking at passages of Scripture necessarily today uh, because we've, we've looked at so many of those, but I just want to give a wrap-up of what we did last week and the week before that. And then we're going to go into one more idea this, that I really thought was important to cover with you about this, this doctrine of the Trinity. We started with this idea a couple of weeks ago. We said, what is the doctrine of the Trinity? What, exactly what is it? And again, if I, can get, if, I, if I can define it simply, we defined it this way. Doctrine of the Trinity, God is one in essence and three in person. That's essentially what we said. The second uh, idea that we tackled was, why does the doctrine of the Trinity matter? Why, why does it matter? And we looked at John chapter 4, and this idea of, of the, the necessity of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, that, that I, I need to know who God is. If I'm going to worship him as God, then I, and it makes sense that I really need to know who this God is. I, I need to know him, know about him, know, know, know all that kind of stuff. And so we looked at that, and we talked about a couple different ideas about, uh, about why it's important. And we said one of the things we said, we said, is that it helps us to know, understand, and worship God correctly. If you were here uh, when we covered that, then it helps us to know, uh, understand, and worship God correctly. And that is a really important thing. And the other idea that we brought out was that it helps us to identify false religions and ideas about God because they are numerous and there's lots of them out there and lots of people. And so it's important for, for us to be able to identify some of that, the doctrine of the Trinity, helps in that way. And then the third, I think this is the third idea we came up with that we looked at was uh, where did the doctrine of the Trinity come from? And I mentioned, we looked at that, that, uh, that people that reject the doctrine of Trinity, one of the things they'll say is the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible. It is a man-made thing. Uh, man developed this idea that it, it's, it's just totally man-made. The word Trinity is not even in the Bible. And so we explored that idea. Where does the doctrine of the Trinity come from? And if you were here, or, or you can go back and listen to those messages um, on iTunes or YouTube or wherever you want to see them uh, from our website. You, you'll, we'll, we looked at a myriad of passages of Scripture that, that build this case for the doctrine of the Trinity. And so what we came away with, the conclusion was this, that the doctrine of Trinity comes not from the mind of man, but it comes from the mind of God. That God reveals it to us uh, through His Word, and, he helps us to, and, and through that process, it helps us to understand Him more Clearly. Can I get an amen? amen? Just making sure y'all are awake. Just want to keep y'all going on that. I know the review is kind of tough sometimes. So uh, that, that was part we said. And then last week, we just covered one idea because it went into a lot of stuff about it. But we looked at uh, who rejects the doctrine of the Trinity. I thought it was important to bring out some of the major players uh, in, in world religions, uh, especially the monotheistic religions and the religions that try to pass themselves off as just another Christian denomination or belief system, and we looked at a number of those players in that, different religions, and we looked at, you know, what they believed in, in addition to some of that, and why what they believed was wrong, and, uh, and how you defend yourself, and we spent some time looking at the passage of Scripture and how you defend yourself when someone comes to the door uh, who rejects the doctrine of the Trinity and, and how you deal with that, okay? So hopefully that, that's helpful, and again, those uh, resources are available online, and you can Use those, and I hope that uh, you will. Uh, because people are, are they're right? There are people everywhere that have misconceptions, mis false ideas, unknown whatever, right? Yes. Come on. 
There are. Are we, are we going to engage them? Right? I, uh, Cindy and I went to a wedding uh, Friday evening, and on our way down, I went down. I had met this guy uh, on, uh, online. That sounds weird. Uh, through, I met this guy. I met this guy through Craigslist that does guitar repairs, and uh, I have an old 12 string that I needed to have the bridge reset. And so I connected with this guy. In the course of our conversations, you know, I, I told him I was a, a pastor, and he responds. He says, "Oh yeah, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ." And so I thought, "Ah, oh, this guy's a believer." So I uh, went down Friday and stopped off at his shop and picked up the two guitars I had there uh, that he was doing some work for me. And uh, so he was telling me about some tough times he'd been going through. And, and I said, well, you know, uh, here's, and I, I said this now, here's, here's the great thing. I said, God can take the good and the bad. He can take all of it and he can use it in our lives. And he says, yeah. He said, well, he said, uh, you know, I, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I'm a practicing Buddhist. And, and that, I, I'll just be honest with you, that really caught me off guard because of what he, I, I've never heard of, I've never had a Buddhist say, most Buddhists are not, they're not antagonistic toward Christianity, but I've never had a Buddhist say to me, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ and I practice Buddhism. And, uh, and so uh, we didn't have time, we had to get on to the wedding, but, I, but I, I said to him, man, I'd love to talk with you, I'd love to sit down, have some lunch together, and, and talk about your belief system and how you've arrived at this idea, because he, he, remember we talked last week, if you were here, about this idea of syncretism, that all really, that's exactly where he was, I mean, he, he might as well had that bumper sticker on the back of his car, because that's exactly where he was, the, uh, the, the spirit, the, 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 the spirit God or something, he said, uh, d- different different ways he shows himself. We'll talk about that some today. Um, and, and so all I'm saying to you is, man, be ready. Be ready to respond. That's, that's why God has us here. It's part of, of how he uses us. So here we go. Here's the, the last idea that I wanted to try and cover uh, this morning, and that is this. How can God be one and at the same time three? Right? Okay, I, 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 from the very beginning, I wanted to at least address this issue, is, 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 this what appears to be a contradiction. How, how can God, how can you guys say that God is one, but God is three? Because that sure sounds like a contradiction. And that is, in fact, why uh, some people reject the doctrine of the Trinity, because they said it's a contradiction. How can God be uh, one, and how can God, and at the same time, be three. So I wanted to kind of address that idea with you today, okay? Remember, I'm qualified. <laughs> so, I've said this before, I will say it again, we can spend the rest of our lives delving into this subject matter, delving into this idea of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, the teaching about the Trinity, the idea that God is three, and we can spend the rest of our lives talking about this fact, and we will never fully comprehend all that the doctrine of the Trinity is. We will never fully get our minds around this idea. And, and as I've said, why should we? If God is beyond us, then it's okay to say that some things about God are beyond us. He, he is beyond us. So, so we may never fully understand. But just because we do not understand something, now listen to me, just because we do not understand something does not necessarily mean that that something is untrue. Okay? Just because I can't fully understand something doesn't mean that it's necessarily untrue. In fact, when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, I would argue that the fact that we cannot fully understand the doctrine of the Trinity is actually evidence that it must come from God and therefore must be true. Because, now stay with me here, I think, I think I'm, this makes sense. Because no one would invent the idea of the doctrine of the Trinity. No, aside from, from uh, special revelation, uh, God revealing it to us, no one would come up with the idea of the doctrine of the Trinity. The, the idea, no, no, God, oh God is one and God is three. Nobody would invent that idea. I would say to you, nobody would want to. Nobody would want to invent the doctrine of the Trinity because if you want to convince something, some people of something, if you're going to make something up and you want to convince people that it's true, you would always choose to to make something up that made sense to them in order to believe it. Do you understand what I'm saying? That if it made sense to them, oh, okay, I, I, I get that. By the way, 
as long as we're not on this subject, by the way. That's why the vast majority of the world's population is trying to work their way to heaven. That's why the, 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 that's why all other religions besides biblical Christianity, that's why all other religions at their root are a works salvation. Do you know why? Because it makes sense to, to, a, a, to, a, to a man, to a person, to a woman, uh, in their sin nature, and we have the sin nature, we're, we're born into the sin nature, in their sin nature, it makes sense. Now think about this, it makes sense. Well, if doing wrong, if committing sins, if that got me in trouble with God, then doing good, doing right, should get me out of trouble with God. Do you understand? That makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. And so, the vast majority of the world is taught to believe that if I, if I do enough good, if I act the right way, if I, if I do the certain things, I, 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 can, I can get there. But biblical Christianity teaches exactly the opposite. Biblical Christianity teaches that that God simply chose to love us out of no need in his own nature within himself. God simply chose to love us and to demonstrate that love to us by dying for us, by redeeming us, by dying for us, even while we were his enemies. Romans 5, 8. He simply chose to do this thing. And it has nothing to do with what you can or can't do for God. You, could, you can spend a hundred lifetimes doing good deeds, and it won't bring you one iota closer to God. It won't pay off even the, the simplest sin. Because, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man, so that no one can boast. Why? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has ordained that we should, what? Walk in them, that that becomes our life. In other words... Paul says, oh, you'll be good. You'll do, you'll do good works. God has purposes and plans uh, that will be good for the kingdom, that will be good for the world, that will be good for your fellow man, that will be good for you. You will do good works, but not in order to earn God's approval, but because you've been approved because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not in order to, to, to uh, pay off your sins, but because your sins have been paid off. By the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. And so, so I want to do good. I, I want to do the right thing. I want, and sometimes I say the wrong thing. And I wish I didn't say the wrong thing. And why did I say that? I, know, I understand we're still in this flesh. But, but God, His Spirit, has, has caused this change in me so that I want to do good. But there's a clear understanding that that good in no way earns or gains God's approval. You understand? Listen to me. To the world? That makes no sense at all. None. Why? What? What? Why would God suffer for me? Why wouldn't God make me suffer for him? Since, by the way, I'm the one that did it. I'm the one that caused this rift between me and God. I'm the one who sinned. I'm the one that broke what I could have with God. Why would God choose to suffer and bleed and die on my behalf. It makes no sense. Listen to me. We may never understand, and we won't fully understand this, this unbelievable, magnanimous grace gift, but if you, if you haven't, if you never have, I would strongly suggest that you fall before his feet, spiritually speaking, and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Stop wondering about why. And just surrender to him and, and commit your life to Jesus Christ. Now, I chase that grace rabbit to make a point. And that is, just because we cannot fully understand something does not mean that it's not true. You will never fully understand why God would do what he, what he did for you. 
And because we can never under, fully understand the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, does not mean that it's not true. And as I said, it in fact becomes evidence that it must be true because it comes from the mind of God. So remember this, and I've said this throughout this series that we've been, I, I keep stating this, this truth to you. Remember this, God is not trying to prove himself. God is revealing himself. I keep making that statement because I, think, I, I really believe it's a very important statement. God is not trying to prove himself. God is revealing himself. God is under no obligation to, re, to explain to you or to prove to you that he is three in one. He reveals that about himself in Scripture. We learn that about him clearly, but, but God's not trying to... Proving himself is not on God's agenda. Never has been, never will be. He says, thus saith the Lord. Here I am. See, here's the truth. Get your mind around this. God doesn't want us to understand uh, so, that he, so that we will believe God wants us to believe so we can understand. And, th- and there's a difference there. Do you understand? Look at that a minute. There's a difference between that. God doesn't want us to believe, to, to understand so that we'll be, oh, if, I, if, it, God, if God just helped me understand this, if you just explain this to me, then I'll believe. No. God says, no, nah, uh-uh. Mm-mm. There, there's this element of faith that God uh, placed with, within us and that there's this desire for us to, to act on this. And he says, believe, and I'll help you understand. We'll never fully comprehend it all. But we can know him. Okay? All right? So, the doctrine of the Trinity. How, 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 can we say, how can we say God is three and God is one? Well, we started this thing a couple weeks ago by defining it. I reviewed it just a minute ago, but again, the definition. God is one in essence and three in person. How is that possible? How does that work? All right, let's, let's look at it, because it sounds like a contradiction. Stay with me. You with me? In order for something to be contradictory, all right? In order for something to be contradictory, it must violate what is known as the law of non-contradiction. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a law. Some city passed it. I know, no, not really, but it's not. It's, it's, it's known as the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction says this. It says that A, whatever, A cannot be both A, what it is, and non-A, what it is not, at the same time and in the same relationship or in the same way. You understand? Something can't be this and at the same time and in the same way be this. Contradictory. Violates the law of non-contradiction. You with me? <laughs> okay. All right. So, let's, uh, let's say, for instance, my wife uh, made me a strawberry rhubarb pie this week. Uh, she knows it's probably my favorite pie. I love all pies, pretty much. But that's one of my favorite. Uh, not mincemeat. Please, nobody make me a mincemeat pie. But, uh, but, but it's one of my favorite pies. And rhubarb apparently is in season. So, she made me a strawberry rhubarb pie. And there's none left at all. But <laughs> if I say, I love strawberry rhubarb pie, and I say, I hate strawberry rhubarb pie, what have I done? I've contradicted myself. I violated the law of non-contradiction. A cannot be both A, what it is, and non-A, what it is not, at the same time and in the same way. Okay? If I say... I love wearing matching shirts with my wife. And I say, I don't love wearing matching shirts with my wife. I've contradicted myself. I've violated the law of non-contradiction. A cannot be both A, what it is, and non-A, what it is not. Are you all with me? If I say the moon is made of cheese, and then I say the moon is not made of cheese... I have violated the law of non-contradiction. A cannot be both A what it is and non-A what it is not. Am I making a point? Do you get it? That's the law of non-contradiction. Some things, however, may seem or sound contradictory, but in fact are not contradictory. Uh, in, in one of his books, in discussing the, the idea of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, theologian R.C. Sproul gives an example of this 
from Charles Dickens' famous novel, A Tale of Two Cities. And in, that, in the opening line of A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens opens with this idea. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Now, that is obviously a contradiction. If, by that statement, Dickens means that it was the worst of times in exactly the same way, in exactly the same time, that it was the best of times. That violates the law of non-contradiction. But... If you've read the novel, you know that that is not what Dickens means. What he means that in one way, in one sense, it was the worst of times. But in another sense, in another way, it was the best of times. Therefore, it sounds contradictory, but it in fact is not. It does not violate the law of non-contradiction. You understand? Here's an example. I, I came up with this myself and I kept thinking, is this right? Am I, am I right about this? So I don't know. But here it is. If, uh, if, if you happen to get a, uh, be in a conversation with a woman, with your wife or your uh, sister, or what, uh, a woman who has just given birth uh, to, her, to a child, maybe her first child, you, you could quite possibly hear her say, that was the worst time of my life, that was the best time of my life. That's a contradiction if she means that that it was the worst time and the best time in the exact same way and the exact same time. But that's not what she means, is it? She means that it was the worst pain she's ever experienced in her life. Can I get an amen, sisters, that have had children? I don't know. I've never been there. Don't know. Okay? She means it was the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life, but but she also means it was the best moment in her entire life when that child was placed into her arms, that newborn child was placed into her arms. It sounds like a contradiction when you hear it, but it's actually not. It doesn't violate the law of non-contradiction. So, when we talk about the Trinity, the idea that the Trinity, that God is one and God is three, it, is, it does not violate the law of non-contradiction because, as I would say this way, God is one and three at the same time, but not in the same way. This is the key to understanding, not to understanding the doctrine of the Trinity, all right, but to understanding why the doctrine of the Trinity does not violate the law of non-contradiction and therefore is not a contradiction. When someone says, that's a contradiction, how can God be three and one? And you can say, I'm glad you asked. Let me explain to you. Have you heard of the law of non-contradiction? And you can walk right on through it. That's the key to understanding that God is one and three at the same time, but not in the same way. Okay, how is God uh, one? God is one. We looked at this earlier, but God is one in essence. Yeah. How is God three? God is three in person. Essence and person are not the same thing. Therefore, it is not a contradiction to say that God is one and God is three because he is not one in, in the exact same way at the exact same time that he is three. Do you understand? I mean, at least what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say, that it doesn't violate the law of non-contradiction. And so, we can say that since God is one in a different way than he is three, the Trinity is not a contradiction. Now, we could, go, we could move on into and try and differentiate essence from person because they're not the same, and we could begin to work on that idea of what is essence and what is person and how are those things different. But I'll just be honest with you, this, 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 this time, this, it just doesn't allow for it. It's just too much, but it's, but it's certainly something you can study on your own. You can even Google definitions of essence and and persons and, and things like that. It's something you can do. But, but I simply wanted to point out the fact that I want you to understand that, that it's not a contradiction. It's not an irrational, the, the doctrine of Trinity is not an irrational contradiction. Okay? Since God is one in a different way than he is three, the doctrine of the Trinity is not a contradiction. Now, let me just say this. Uh, Be careful, just be careful of analogies or illustrations that are sometimes used to try and explain the doctrine of the Trinity, all right? And I understand their purpose, I understand they're they're trying to take an infinitely 
uh, complex subject and, and put it in terms that, that maybe we can understand it a little bit. I understand the purposes of it, but I also say to you, it's okay to say, you know what? That's God, man. I can't, I just, I, I'll never fully comprehend everything about God, so I can, I can rest in that fact. But I understand the purpose of analogies and illustrations, but I'm just saying to you, be careful because all illustrations and analogies, best I can, uh, I've ever seen, all analogies or illustrations about the Trinity uh, eventually break down. At some point, they, they just fall short of this thing that God is, is three distinct persons, but He is one in essence. The Father uh, talks to or about the Son. The Father talks uh, to or about the Spirit. The Son talks to or about the Father. They are distinct persons, unless you want to say that God is somehow schizophrenic. They are, they are distinct persons, and yet they are one in their essence. So, let me give you a couple of examples. Here's a couple of examples of uh, analogies. And this is maybe was one that you've heard before. Uh, and I, I can say this. I am a husband. I am a father. I am a son. I am all three of those things, but I'm one person. Right? Wrong, Colonel Sanders. No. That uh, would be an example of what is known as modalism. Modalism was an ancient heresy that started in the early church that taught that God reveals himself at times as Father. He reveals himself at times as Son. He reveals himself at times as Spirit. In other words, God has different modes, and he reveals himself in different modes at different times. No. No. The Father is the Father, the Son is the Son, the Spirit is the Spirit. They are three distinct persons. Here's a, another one. H2O, water, right? Water can be liquid, water can be solid, water can be ice. It can be three different things, but it's, it's still water. That's an example of the Trinity. No, again, that would be modalism. God is appearing in different forms or different modes. No, no. The doctrine of the Trinity says... That God is Father, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit. They are three, but they are one in their absolute essence, in who they are, in what makes them God. Okay? We will never understand it all. We'll never get our minds fully around it, but that is not a reason to reject it. It is revealed in Scripture, and we built a pretty, I think, a pretty strong case for that. And as I said a couple weeks ago, we could literally look at hundreds more passages of Scripture that build this case for this idea that God is one and He is three. We will never fully understand everything about it, but what we can do is, is, is accept it by faith that this is what God reveals about Himself and this is who God is. And doing this helps us to know God to a greater degree, to know Him more about who he is and, and what he's revealing to us about himself. We can, maybe we can get our minds around this idea. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God, singular, said, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image, according to our, plural, likeness. The very beginning, God says that when he begins to create us. It would be a fair question to ask someone that rejects the doctrine of Trinity, why would God find it necessary to reveal himself through a plural pronoun? Why would God identify himself in a plural pronoun form? Do you understand what I'm saying? Why does God, singular, say, let us? No, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. That's absolutely true. But the Word of God over and over and over again reveals it to be true. This is who your God is. He is Father. He is Son. He is Holy Spirit. And He has chosen to redeem you and me through no need of His own, but simply because He chose. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him would not, should not perish, but would have everlasting life. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our God. That's our heavenly 
Father. Well, Pastor Clay has repeated throughout the three weeks of discussion on the doctrine of the Trinity, we will never fully understand this concept. But the fact that we can't fully understand it is not only okay, it points to the validity of this most important doctrine. As we established in the first week of this discussion, the actual word Trinity is not in the Bible. But hopefully you've seen over these three weeks that the concept that came to be known as the doctrine of the Trinity is all through the Bible. And as we learn today, it is not a contradiction. We invite you to join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather each week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere and celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about relationships. A community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person. Real people who truly care. Solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens. And the most energetic, safe, and fun kids program around. Find out more at crossculturelife.org. I want to lead you to the cross. I want to lead you to the cross. Cross Culture Church in North Rollins, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.